Since the operational shaft is constantly turning, the hub has to turn also, while the tabulation govern opinion can only turn if the tab cord drum turns. This occurs during spacing and during tabulation. In fact, during tabulation, the tabulation govern opinion will try to turn top to the front faster than the operational shaft. That is when the tab governor clutch comes in. It, it limits the RPM of the tab pinion gear to the RPM of the operational shaft, thus giving us an even and smooth movement of the carrier from left to right during tabulation. Slide number 121. As a matter of fact, when the machine is reassembled again, you might depress the tabulation key and then observe that the carrier will only move from left to right by the distance needed in order to tighten the tab governor clutch. If you then, with the use of a screwdriver, push the right end of the governor clutch spring top to the rear as shown here, the carrier will take off immediately and if you aren't careful, it will knock the screwdriver right out of your hand. You better use your left hand to prevent the carrier from causing any mishap. Slide number 122. Now remove the carrier return clutch assembly or the torque limiter assembly. We shall examine it a bit later. Slide number 123. The next item out in our disassembly routine is the operational cam assembly. The operational cam assembly is made up of two ratchet clutches, each one with its own cam. The cam on the left is a spacebar cam, while the cam on the right is used for indexing, carrier return, and on modern machines, the backspace mechanism. On Selectric 1 models, the backspace mechanism is powered by the spacebar cam. Slide number 124. By removing the C-clip, which we are holding in place here with a pair of pliers, it is possible to obtain a good look at the inside of the double ratchet clutch assembly. Stop your tape player wherever you need some more time to catch up with the steps presented in the program. You are expected to go through each step on your own machine, thus be sure to follow it as close as you can. Slide number 125. First of all, look at the shape of these cams. The spacebar cam on the left is double lobed, while the index carrier return engagement cam on the right has only one lobe. This means that the spacebar cam causes two oscillations on the cam follower for each complete revolution of the cam while the carry return engagement cam only causes one oscillation for its cam follower. We only need half of one revolution of the spacebar cam in order to escape our carrier. In fact, this is exactly how the machine operates. Half of one revolution per operation for the spacebar cam and one complete revolution per operation for the carry return engagement cam. Whenever the ratchet clutch is released or allowed to engage, it is up to the spring, indicated by the red pencil, to engage the tooth of the clutch paw, indicated by the blue pencil, with one of the teeth of the clutch ratchet, indicated by the yellow pencil. Since the ratchet is continuously rotating because it is mounted onto the operational shaft, the cam ends up turning also. Slide number 126. This is the carry return engagement cam, and we're looking at it from its left side. If it were mounted and operating in a machine, it would now be rotating clockwise. The small step on the clutch disc, or the clutch flange, indicated by the yellow pencil, will eventually meet the clutch latch, which, with respect to the cam, is located in the 6 o'clock position, directly underneath the clutch. 
at the tip of the clutch pawl, in the 12 o'clock position, you can see the back side of a pin riveted into the pawl. This pin extends into an opening on the clutch disc. When the clutch disc is stopped by the clutch latch, IBM calls it the clutch release lever, the inertia of the cam and the other parts of the clutch keep the cam turning. Since the pawl is fastened to the cam, at the point indicated by the red pencil, it continues to turn also. Slide number 127. As the cam and the pawl continue to rotate, the pin of the pawl, red pencil, meets the edge of the opening in the clutch disc, with the end effect that the pawl is cammed out of engagement with the ratchet, against the action of the ratchet pawl spring, or simply the ratchet clutch spring. This amounts to saying that when the ratchet cam finally stops rotating, because the pawl pin reaches the end of the opening in the clutch disc, the spring is stretched. But a spring does not just sit there and remain stretched. It will collapse unless we hold it in its stretched condition. In fact, it would tend to turn the cam top to the rear of the machine. The point of the cam indicated by the blue pencil would turn to the right in this picture. What we need is to check the stretched spring. On the clutch disc, at the point indicated by the yellow pencil, we apply the clutch latch, or as IBM calls it, the clutch release arm. The clutch latch then prevents the clutch disc from rotating clockwise. Slide number 128. On the outside of the operational cam assembly, this engagement between the plastic or nylon check ring and the check pawl prevents the cam from rotating counterclockwise. The two parts then, the clutch latch and the check pawl, keep the spring stretched. You will recall that the exact same thing happened with the shift cam. On the right end of the spring, the shift clutch latch or release arm prevented the shift ratchet from rotating clockwise, while the shift cam brake and the shift cam detent did the job of the check pawl, namely to keep the clutch spring stretched or its diameter enlarged. Slide number 129. These are the clutch latches, or clutch release arms, for the operational cam clutches. Now that the ratchet clutch assembly is out, they're very easy to see, but this is not at all the case when the machine is back together. It is very important that you be able to recognize these clutch latches even when the machine is assembled. So take a real good look at them. Slide number 130. These are the check paws for the operational cam clutches. They're easy to see when the machine is assembled because they operate on the outside of the operational cams. Slide number 131. This is the best angle for the inspecting of the operational clutch latches or release arms. Since they have to stop the clutch disc, and since the discs are right next to the cams, the clutch latches operate very closely to the lateral surface of the cams. It is important that they do not rub against the cams, and for that it is necessary that you develop the ability to spot them through this opening, even with the machine fully assembled. Take whatever time you need in order to locate them through this opening, and stop your tape player while you do it. Slide number 132. The two arrows in this drawing point at the places which should be checked for the clearance between the clutch latches or release arms and the cans. This drawing came out of the Selectric Typewriter Service Manual, form number 241-5615.
This manual contains superb illustrations of many otherwise difficult to see parts on the Selectric typewriter. The text does not seem to have been written for instructional purposes, and as a result it appears extremely cumbersome and difficult to the unprepared student. But once the basic familiarity with the mechanisms of the typewriter has been developed, it is a most detailed, exact, and useful book for the serviceman, and we recommend that you use it frequently for review purposes. Slide number 133. Since the clutch latch and the clutch check pawl act in opposite directions in order to rotate the ratchet pawl out of the ratchet and keep the clutch spring stretched, the question arises, where and how do we adjust this clutch? It is done by this eccentric. Since the nylon check ring is held in place by two screws, we must also loosen the other screw before we attempt to adjust the position of the check ring.